Um, I had a lot of fun making these coherence protocols because I really like coherence. And I thought it was kind of fun to try to make a protocol that was actually good or like easy to understand, not necessarily the most performant protocol. Um, so, uh, let's see, do I have an outline here? Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a Ruby, the overview of Ruby. Um, we're going to dive into a little bit of detail on the slick controller and how to make these um, state machines, which I'll talk about. Talk a little bit about how to configure Ruby because that's a little bit different than configuring everything else and then a few other small things. Um, so again, I want to go back to this Gem5 history. So it was M5 and Gems. M5 had caches, it had the CPU models, it had this master-slave port interface. <laughs> Gems had a really detailed uh, way to model cache coherence and a really detailed model of uh, network, um, Garnet and Garnet 2.0. So Gems had that, which was great. M5 had everything else, which was great. And, you know, as we'll see, it's still just kind of smushed together, not really deeply integrated. The, the, the long-term vision is to actually replace all the classic caches with Ruby and have, you know, the default caches be pretty simple and you don't have to dive into Ruby unless you really need to be modified to coherence protocol. Um, getting to that grand vision is a lot of work from where we are now. It doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. Okay, so a little bit of overview of uh, Ruby. So you have all these things, CPUs, DMA controllers, other things like maybe GPUs, and they talk to this big black box, which is Ruby. Then on the other side, you have memory controllers, so your DRAM. And so Ruby is just this big black box that you dump requests into, and then they flow out on the other side to memory if they don't hit in the cache. Um, and Ruby is one, essentially, it's one big mem object. It's not exactly how it's done, but it's essentially one big mem object that has all these vector ports on it. And so getting into Ruby and out of Ruby are classic ports, so you can put, you know, any kind of object you want that has a master port can send things into Ruby. So for instance, you know, if you have, say, a GPU model, like Gem5 GPU that I worked on, it's a GPU model, as long as it sends um, requests over a master port, it can talk to Ruby. Then on the other side, you can put any DRAM controller you want down here. You can use the um, DDR3, DDR4, GDDR controllers, whatever you want, um, and it just dumps requests into those memory controllers. Um, you could, in theory, and I haven't tested this, but I think it would work, I think you could put a classic cache here if you wanted to and actually have a mixture of classic caches in Ruby. Never tested it, but I think it's possible. Okay, so if we dive inside Ruby, you can tell we're inside Ruby because this is tinted slightly green. What's inside Ruby is a bunch of controllers. So you have cache controllers, like L1 cache, you have your L2 cache controllers, the directory controller, DMA controllers, controllers for whatever other kind of things might be in your cache system. You have all these controllers, and they're connected via an on-chip network. And again, the network is kind of like a black box. These are all connected into it, and exactly how you lay this out. So the controllers you have, the topology the controllers are in, the kind of interconnect you have, the topology of the interconnect, all of those are variables, and you can choose any combination of those that you want, which makes Ruby incredibly flexible, but also incredibly complicated to um, configure and get to work. So there are controller mod, uh, models. There's the controller topology, which is which controller is connected to which controller, and essentially, you have to set up your topology such that any controller has a path to talk to any other controller. Because you don't know at config time what controllers might want to talk to other controllers. That's part of your protocol, not part of your topology. And then there's also the network model, which I'm not going to be talking much about. Uh, Tushar gave a good talk on this at the ARM Research Summit 
Um, but there's also a model for the network of what kind of routers do you want to use for your on-chip network and how do those communicate. That's Garnet. Or Garnet is the more complex uh, network information. So again, the main goal of Ruby is flexibility, not usability, unfortunately. So it is difficult to use. And then there's also the interface. And so I'm going to talk about um, the controller models and the controller topology and then a little bit about the interface as well. So controller models. These are implemented in a language called Slick. So it's another domain-specific language that has its own compiler within Gem5, its own language features, and everything else. So Slick is a source-to-source -source compiler which takes Slick code, excuse me, and generates um, C++ code, which has been compiled. So I believe the original um, acronym stood for Specification Language Including Cache Coherence. I, it is really hard to find any documentation as to what the original uh, acronym was. It, sound, it seems like uh, Milo and Dan just kind of picked an acronym that sounded good and then worried about what it stood for later. I have a small uh, tangential question on Slick. Is that was it developed as a part of Gem5 effort or it was so it was part of gems. So it was it was developed. I think around the same time as M5 started in the early two, late nineties, early two thousands. I believe it was Milo Martin and Dan Soren started working on um, Slick. One of Mark and David's students are going to be really annoyed with me for getting it wrong if I did. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm pretty sure it was Milo and Dan started working on this. And the original purpose of Slick. So this is a, a cache um, uh, state machine table, which tells us if we're in this state and we get that one of these um, events, this is what we do. And so it, it tells us, you know, if we're in I and we get a load, then we send a get s to the directory and then we transition to the state ISD. For an ISD, we're waiting to get the data from the directory, in which case we transition into S. So this is a state machine table. Slick's original purpose was to take a, um, they, they were working on a bunch of cache, cache coherence papers, and they got tired of building these tables by hand. So they wrote the Slick to take a um, definition of a state machine and convert to an HTML table, which Slick still does. So here is the same table that after you write the protocol in Slick, it still outputs the same uh, table as it did probably back in the uh, early 2000s. Um, so that was the original purpose of Slick. It has since really grown to produce all the C++ code. So not only does it produce an HTML output, it also produces a C++ implementation of that protocol as well. So this is a really quick overview. Details, again, are in the book. Um, and what I'm going to go over is a coherence protocol, MSI, which is which was published in the Primer on Memory Consistency and Coherence by Dan, Mark, and David. Um, and so th this is a pretty simple co directory coherence protocol. Um, and I've basically just copied the tables from the book into uh, Slick. Of course, it still took like two weeks to debug it, but um, it mostly follows what's in the book. Okay, so what you have in Slick are state machine files, which is why the extension is .sm. And the state machine files define a state machine. Um, so first we have the uh, O1 cache. So at the top of your state machine file, you have these parameters up here. So we have a sequencer, a cache memory, other kinds of parameters you might want to have. And to show you how this is translated, we need to compile this. Oop, that was what I meant to do. So, um, Let's see, I talked earlier, if you look at, look in build ops, 
there's a bunch of different options. So for instance, there's x86, but there's also x86 messy two level and uh, Mosey AMD base. Um, if you look at this file, build ops um, x86 Mosey AMD base, it has parameters in it, protocol, target ISA, CPU models. These are parameters that are passed into SCONs automatically. So when I did x86, it built the protocol in my example. So if I want to override that when I'm running SCONs, I can say on the command line, protocol equals, I want to build MSI. And so you can override those options with the command line. And you can also name where you're putting, oops, You can also name your build directory, whatever you want. And if you end up working with multiple coherence protocols, often you're comparing one coherence protocol to another, you have to store those in different build directories because you need to recompile every time you change coherence protocols. Kind of a pain, um, but that's the way uh, um, Slick is designed. Okay, so while that's, oh, I, sorry. just kill all this stuff so we can build. Okay, so while that's going, I wanted to look at oh, something died. Looks like my connection died. Sorry. So, uh, let's see, while that's going, we take the state machine file. It's run through Slick and it generates a bunch of files. So Slick generates an L1 cache controller.py, which is our sim object declaration file. It generates the cache controller.cc.hh file, which actually implements this. It also generates cache entries, states, transitions, wake up, and a bunch of other files. So, assuming this is back, which it looks like it is, um, if we look at in build. Thank you. So we have all these files that are automatically generated by Slick. Let's specifically look at the L1 cache. So we have this L1 cache controller.py, which just looks like the sim object declaration file that we saw before. And all these things that are, all these parameters, are whatever parameters we put as the parameters to our um, state machine file. So it was a sequencer, cache memory, send evictions. We have sequencer, cache memory, send evictions, and then a few others. That we'll talk, the, uh, all these memory buffers that we'll talk about in a minute. Message buffers. So it just generates the exact same things as what we've been looking at before. Um, in the controller, it inherits from abstract controller, which is in Ruby. Um, which is just a sim object. So, I mean, th this might sound like a lot of detail, but if you're digging into, if you ever make a coherence protocol, you really need to understand how these are pieces fit together because you're going to get errors and you need to know where to look to see um, where the errors coming from. So it's really important to never modify the files that are generated in your build directory. If you need to modify a coherence protocol, modify the state machine files. Don't go in and modify the C and C++ files. Sometimes it's useful to go look and see what they're doing, 
but you should never modify them. Is it possible to use Ruby to basically create a structure that you then continue using outside of Ruby? So there's Garnet standalone. But I don't know, I don't think Ruby works. Or the slick things only generate Gem5 code. Well, they, they generate Gem5. What I'm saying is that use Ruby once to generate Gem5 code and then continue on modifying the Gem5 files and no longer use Ruby. No, there's no good way to do that. And, and you wouldn't want to. Okay. I can show you why you wouldn't want to. L1, cache, control, uh. You wouldn't want to because this is the code. I like this one a lot. Do you think it has enough parentheses? The code is just awful that it generates. Are you sure that's C and not Lisp? Uh, it could be Lisp. Um, so you, uh, you really wouldn't want to do that. OK, so let's go through a um, state machine file. So the first thing in a state machine is the parameters. And specifically, you have cache memory and message buffers. So the cache memory is what's actually holding the state of the cache. So inside the cache memory is where the data is stored, and also where the tags are stored, and the states for each block. Your cache blocks are stored in the cache memory, which is decoupled from the controller logic, which is controlling your cache, which is how caches are actually implemented. Right? You, you have a controller logic piece down here, and then you have your tags over here and your data over here. Um, and so th this is similar to what Ruby does. The other part of your parameters is the message buffers, which are what you use to send and receive data from the network. So if we look at um, sorry, what is that? That's terrible. Um, so we've got our cache. This has um, five message buffers. It has message buffers to send requests to the directory, to send a response to either the directory or other caches, to receive request, receive forwards from the directory, and receive responses from other caches. So these are all things that are going into and out of the Ruby network. So these cache controllers just have these message buffers that are going in and out of the network. Um, and then there's a special message buffer on the L1 caches called the mandatory queue, which is where requests come from the CPU, are coming from the mandatory queue. So we have these message buffers. So then after that, we have state declarations which declare all the different states that we're going to have in our cache. So for instance, in MSI, we have three stable states, oops, M, S, and I, and then a bunch of intermediate states. For instance, ISD, which is I transitioning to S, waiting for data. Or IMA, which is I transitioning to M. We've gotten the data, but we're waiting for other acts before we can transition to M. Um, and because it's a coherence protocol, you need to have all these different intermediate states to deal with different things. After state declarations, we have event declarations. So these are all the events that can be triggered. So this is just a state machine. So you have states and events, and these are the events that can be triggered to move from one state to another. So for this cache, um, we have these states, loads and stores or replacement, um, forwards from other caches, and then information from the directory. Um, and then there's a bunch of other structures that you need to find in your state machine as well. So things like, you know, Ruby is really flexible, and so you can actually define in Ruby what your, in, your cache entry looks like. So the simplest one just simply has a state and a data block, but your entry could have other all sorts of other things as well. It could have, um, let's see, other things. I'm not. I'm blanking on what else you would want. 
But uh, for instance, with the region coherence, you would have uh, a bit vector. So if, if this was a um, super block hash, you could have a bit vector showing which subblocks are valid and invalid, or maybe subblock states, for instance. So there's TBEs, called, uh, which stands for transaction buffer entry. This is really like the um, MSHR in caches. It stores information while you have outstanding transactions. Um, so when you have a miss, you create a, you, you create a TBE entry um, or TBE uh, and store the outstanding request in this TBE. You need a TBE table similar to an MSHR table. It's just a bunch of TBEs. Um, and then a bunch of other things. Most of these aren't too important. You have functions that wrap things like get state and set state. Um, and then some other functions to allow outside things to interact with the cache controller, like functional reads and writes. Any questions so far? Okay, so then um, you also have, the, the, probably the most important part of the controller is the imports. So these are, you have a message buffer that gets data that comes in. So for instance, you have the response from directory or sibling message buffer. It gets response messages. Um, and then you need to look at that message and try to decide what action or what event to trigger. Um, and so we look at this message Let's see, if it is a coherence response type data, wait, sorry. If it's from the directory, then we look to see how many acts we've received so far, or how many acts are on the message. And we either trigger an event, the data dir with no acts, or data dir with acts. Or if it's from another cache, we might trigger, sorry, we might trigger an event data owner, um, or an invalidate. So this, in the import, is where you decide, given the current state of the system, what event am I going to trigger? Um, is in these imports. And so this is where in the logic you can say, if this, then do something else. Nowhere else can you use if, well, nor should you use if statements in Slick. Then you have actions. So these are things, when you trigger an event, you're going to transition from one state to another and perform actions. So these actions can be things like send a get m to the directory, or send a put s, or send cache data to requester. So these are really simple actions that just do one thing. And then finally, the last part is the transitions, which defines when you're in some state, how to transition. So if we go down here, we see if we're in state I and we get a store event, then we're going to transition to IMAD, allocate a cache block, allocate a TDE, send a get M, and then pop that request off of the queue. And so once you combine these transitions with everything else, you get a working state machine. And so the way this all fits together is message buffers send things to imports, imports um, trigger events. The Depending on what state you're in, you move from one transition to the other based on that event, which performs actions, and then those actions can update cache memory, and actions can send other things out on message buffers. So this is kind of how everything fits together in a state machine file. Um, so let's see, I think I talked about this. The only particularly weird thing about cache memory is usually you just go get the data from the entry from cache memory. Um, there's a cache probe function whenever you need to replace something to figure out what to replace. Um, uh, a common gotcha is if you access something in the cache, you need to call set MRU on it to make it the most recently used thing. 
Um, if you don't call set MRU, that entry will never be updated with MRU information. And so your replacement policy will just be meaningless. I see we talked about message buffers a little bit. There's a bunch of um, functions you can call on message buffers. Um, state declarations we talked about. So there's these access permissions, which essentially allow you to do functional accesses in Ruby, um, which actually is kind of broken today. So the access permission is a good idea, but I don't think it works very well right now. Um, talked about that, event declarations, these other structures. Um, the ports are not Gem 5 ports. It's unfortunate that it's the same name. Um, the import is where most of the magic is. Yeah, so import, all of your import things are called every single cycle. And each import is checked, is it ready, is there any messages at the head that are ready? And if it is, then it executes your logic in that import block. Which I think, uh, yeah, I mean, example. So uh, within the import block, there's, or within Slate, there's some weird syntax going on. So you have these things like peak. So if you call peak, and this is actually a code block within the peak, inside this code block automatically has this in message variable populated for you. Um, and then trigger are, looks through all the transitions to find a transition to trigger based on the current state of the cache entry and the TBE. Additionally, when you pass in the address, cache entry, and TBE into trigger, these will automatically appear as local variables in your actions. They're just magically there. Um, so within the action, we have this magic thing, address, which was the address that we used in the trigger. Um, we also have a cache entry in TBE, although they don't come up here. And again, in Q, is kind of like peak. It has a magic variable inside the uh, code block, which is out message. It's just automatically there. And whatever you set on out message, that gets in queued at the end of the code block. We talked about uh, transitions. That's I on a store. We go to IMAD. You can also write more complicated transitions, such as if you're in either of these two states and either of these two events occur, then transition down and do these things. So you can collapse some transitions together, although it turns out to not be very common. Um, okay, I want to briefly show you this complete protocol. Um, so this is what the protocol looks like, and these HTML tables are really nice when you're debugging. Um, you can say, click on this, that is a send cache data to requester. So if you're in MIA and you go to forward get S, you send the data to the requester, send the data to the directory, and then pop the forward queue and transition into this state. And if you want to know how to get to this state SIA, this shows you all the different ways to get to that state and what events got you there. So it's a pretty nice thing. Um, and the directory is similar, though in this case the directory is a lot simpler than the cache. If you're ever doing, oh, I guess the, the, the other thing, um, to get this table, you have to pass a parameter to SCADs. It doesn't, it isn't automatically generated. We found that if we automatically generate this HTML table every time, that it added like 30 seconds to Jim Fox build, which is kind of terrible. So we turned off the automatic code table generation. OK, so just a couple more minutes, um, and then we have a break. So the Ruby configuration scripts um, don't follow the Jim Fox style at all and they require tons of boilerplate to write. Um, you have to go through multiple steps, initiating controller, instantiating controllers, creating a sequencer for every CPU. So this is the interface between memory, the Ruby ports and uh, select, or these sequencers, and then you have to create 
the network and the topology and everything. Um, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip over this. Um, but I do want to talk about the sequencer. Um, so the sequencer can be either called Ruby port or a sequencer. It is a mem object, so it has ports. And essentially what it does is convert Gem5 packets into Ruby requests, just send through Ruby. And then on the other side, once the Ruby request is complete, it will convert it back to a packet to reply. Um, and all these new messages are delivered to the mandatory queue. And there's a similar thing on the other side of Ruby to send requests to the memory. Um, it's a queue memory read and queue memory write. Convert from Ruby requests into packets to send to the memory system. So I have a small question there. Yeah. Uh, so this is a software construct, right? Sequencer. Yes. There is no hardware. I guess there is a message. Uh, no, there's no hardware. And, and in fact, is this the sequencer causes um, some modeling error. It takes one extra cycle to get things out of the own cache than it would otherwise because of the sequencer. Um, you can get around that and forget exactly how. Can you put your own cache in Outside of Ruby? No, you can't do that because then you don't wouldn't have coherence. You need to deliver invalidates to it. Um, yeah, the, the the sequencer is not a real hardware thing, and it can cause issues in modeling if you're not careful. Um, okay, so a few other things. Um, so if you're looking for the configuration, it's actually in like three different directories. So it's in configs network is where the network models are, configs topologies are where, how you connect the controllers together, and then configs Ruby has a different configuration file for every single protocol. Um, the code in most of these are just copy pasted from other places, and so it's just a mess of spaghetti code um, in there. I'm really sorry for anyone who has to read this code. I have a simpler, a simple Ruby script, but it still is not great. Um, so in source mem slick is the code for the slick compiler. If you're making a coherence protocol that isn't just a normal directory protocol or something that someone's done before, you will almost certainly have to modify the compiler. Don't be scared of modifying the compiler. It's all written in Python. It's not that bad. It's pretty easy to understand what the compiler is doing. Um, you know, for instance, you know, one of the things that people did with Slick was they created token coherence. They had to go in and modify the compiler to get the tokens in there. I did a region coherence protocol. I had to go in and modify the compiler to understand memory regions instead of just addresses. So uh, almost anything you want to do that's outside the norm, you're going to have to go modify the compiler to get it to work. Um, there's other things in source mem Ruby, the structures like cache memory and replacement policies. And then in the system is all this integration between uh, Gem5, the classic Gem5, and um, Ruby. There's other stuff as well, like bloom filters and profiling and network models. Um, and then here's a big list of current protocols. We were talking uh, at the break last time so protocols I trust, Mozy Hammer has been extensively tested. Uh, the Mozy AMD base is a relatively new protocol from AMD, which supposedly is similar to some of their more recent chips. Um, AMD has some GPU protocols that works with their GPU device. Um, and then there's uh, MI example, which you should never, ever, ever use, even though that's the default that's compiled. Um, and then the Messies, which the Messy 2 level I trust, Messy 3 level was a little bit of a hack to try to get an LLC. So we didn't cover a lot of things, obviously, as I'm going so fast. Um, there's a lot of details for writing coherence protocols. So I, go, I do an okay job in the book of going through some of the thought process behind writing the coherence protocol, but it's really in the primer that they talk about why you choose different things. Um, 
and then I wish I had time to talk about debugging because that's where you spend most of your time when you're building coherence protocols is debugging them. Um, using the Ruby random tester is really good. It sends random things into the memory system such that it's most likely to trigger transitions. Um, and then using protocol trace, which traces through the protocol and shows you for every single um, tick what transitions are happening and why they're happening. Okay, so I just covered a lot of Ruby. Any questions before we go get coffee? I see the tops of lots of people's heads. It's tough in the afternoon. So I have a, like a small uh, follow-up on the previous slide. Uh, is it, would it be possible to get a command line, a sample command line, a uh, dummy command line to use Ruby random tester? Yeah, so there's one in the book. Um, yeah, so actually let's see if I can, I will try real fast to see if I can do it. Um, we're in part three now. Yeah, so the Ruby test.py, which is checked in. Um, if we look at the protocol trace. Runs through slowly. Um, and so this shows you the, the tick, the machine, the action that's happening, the transition from this um, state to that state because of some particular address. And it uses the... Garnet this is using the random tester. Yeah, but it uses garnet network or... No, this is just using a simple, simple network. network. But we can I think you can pretty simply extend it. In the config pilot, it would work. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? <laughs>